Hey, Tati here and welcome to Calmly Coping. Today I am here with Angela Brown, who is the CEO of Savvy Cleaner. And today we're going to talk about cleaning and organizing because I think that is something that can have a huge impact on mental health. And I'm curious to hear from Angela what she has to say about it. So it's so great to have you here, Angela. Can you let us know more about yourself and how you got into being the CEO of Savvy Cleaner and, and this field of expertise? Yes, thank you so much for having me on the show today. Um, I've been a professional house cleaner for the last 25 years and growing a business all over North and South Carolina. And we had a branch in Los Angeles, California. In the summer of 2015, I pivoted my business. We had a, a troubled 15 year old that came to live with us and I needed to restructure my life at that time because she needed 24 seven care. And in the process of doing that, what I knew was cleaning. And so I took my cleaning expertise and I moved it online, which created a whole bunch of high functioning anxiety for me because I'd never been online before. We grew a business by referral only. And so suddenly now I was like, oh no, there's this internet thing. <laughs> How do I cope with that? So it was really alarming to me because it was a new skill set that I didn't have, but I knew if I was going to reinvent myself and I was going to start a business that I had to do whatever it takes. So willing to do whatever it takes I jumped into a bunch of stuff that I didn't know, which created a whole bunch of unnecessary stress, but now I had to learn social media. I had to learn websites. I had to learn search engine optimization. I'd never created courses before. I'd never created a, an online marketing program, and I didn't know how to sell any of it online. This was completely foreign to everything that I know. And so I said, well, this is what God gave me. This is what's in front of me. Let me take the information that I know about house cleaning, and I will help other cleaning business owners create their own cleaning businesses. And at the same time, now I'm trying to learn all these extra skills. So again, I am from the background where I, I want to do right by my customers. And in order to try to give them the best of myself, I created all this weird, unnecessary stress. But at the same time, we were delivering as, you know, as, we, as we went. What was interesting to me, though, was how do I get from here to there? Like, how do I move into an online marketplace if I, if I don't have an online market? marketplace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so to me, the quickest, fastest way to get there was to create a YouTube show and a podcast. And so I said, well, I don't know how to do that. You know, what, what can I do? And so I took the skills that I have and I built a podcast called Ask a House Cleaner, which is also a YouTube show. And so that's kind of how I got started in what I'm doing right now. Um, and then bringing all of the cleaning expertise in the background to this platform where I could then share that with other people. Um, speaking about the high functioning anxiety, though, and what I wasn't expecting was the journey along the way, because I started out just with cleaning business owners. And then as we got in about a year and a half into the business, this is the podcast, the YouTube show, as we started building out courses. The Airbnb industry just smacked us upside the head. And they said, what do you have for us? We, uh, we clean not every other week, but we clean like three and four times a week as we're flipping properties for our new guests and our new tenants that come in. How, how do you do that? I was like, whoa, <laughs> again, more stress and more anxiety. And we started hiring more people and picking up you know, other av avenues of cleaning in order to serve those customers. Mm. Yeah, that, that sounds like a fascinating story. So it sounds like you really had to pivot from being a local business and from doing that relationship building and, and networking to then going into the online arena. And so you brought up how that high functioning anxiety showed up for you. So I'm curious to hear how did what was that like for you, you know, managing all of that, that stress and anxiety that came up from that change and that transition? Well, the first thing that I had to realize was, uh, and it goes back to the 15 year old that was living with us. She was pushing a lot of my buttons and she was in mandatory 12 hours of therapy a week. And so managing that, I had to make some changes. And in this moment of pivot, I said, I can keep doing what I'm doing because I know it and it's a well-oiled machine and we have systems in place and I was in my comfort zone, but I have this other thing going on in my personal life that has nothing to do with my comfort zone. And because she, she dropped in on us, she, she came to live with us at age 15. It's not like you're, you're pregnant for nine months and you have a chance to plan and prepare for all this stuff. This is just like troubled teenager, boom, here I am. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lot of skills that I didn't have. 
and I wanted to do right by her. I wanted to do right by my customers. And here I am torn. Do I go this route or this route? And I said, you know, I, I can't, I can't really do both. And I don't like to admit failure because I'm a very uh, high achiever and I like to always have all my ducks in a row. And I am known by my systems and the things that I have in order. Suddenly my life was really chaotic and it was out of order. And I felt like I was treading water. I mean, I felt like I was sinking really fast, but just treading water. And so she's pushing all these buttons in me and I'm trying not to let her know how aggravated I've become on the inside. So the levels of stress were going up and I'm looking at my business and they say, if you chase two rabbits, both will get away. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm chasing two rabbits. Do I go this route or this route? And so I decided that it wasn't fair to my customers or my employees or the leads that were managing the employees for me to hang on to that area of my business. And it wasn't fair to her because I had welcomed her into my home. And I said, this is a safe place. You're welcome here. And so it's not fair to her if I'm trying to manage all this other stuff and I'm unavailable to her if this is what she's going through at this time. And so I made a decision. I said, let's sell the business. We've done it for 25 years. It's been super successful. We had a great run at it. Let's go out while we're on top and I'll figure something else out. And so now I'm going into the great unknown. And as I sold my business, I had enough money that I could, I could start up. And I say start up because every startup business costs a lot of money just to start up. And it's probably going to be a few months before you actually make money. And so I could go for about 18 months without dipping into my savings. And I was a debt-free company. I was like super proud of myself. I'm this high achiever. Go, Angela. And then here I found myself just scrambling from day to day to try to keep, you know, like I say, treading water, trying to keep my head above water with all of the unknown stuff that I've never dealt with before. I've never dealt with the frustrations and, you know, the dysfunctions of violence and, you know, suicidal tendencies and things like that. That was, it, this was new for me and I was really out of my comfort zone. Then I'm pivoting and I'm starting a new business and I'm trying to learn how do I edit a YouTube show? <laughs> how do I make a podcast? How do I make a blog? And when I started my blog, I didn't even know how to get like, how do you get a picture up onto the internet? Like, how does it go from the computer to the internet? You know, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not tech savvy. This is a bunch of stuff I didn't know. So I'm trying to learn and on my free time, and I was staying up way too late at night. And at night I would close the bedroom door and I would just bust up into tears. I'm like, what am I doing? How do I do this? And I felt, I felt for the first time in my life, just completely helpless. I felt lost. I felt like I've been so successful for so many years. Like maybe I was, maybe I was riding or coasting on my coattails of, you know, Hey, I got this all figured out. Look at me. And then I realized, wait a second, I I've got the whole rest of my life in front of me. And there's a bunch of skill sets that I don't have. And can you teach an old dog new tricks? And I was like, I don't know, but I don't, I don't have the luxury of wondering. I have to force myself to do it. And so I jumped headfirst into, you know, learning as much as I could and not letting her see my hot buttons. And then as I started up the business, not letting my customers see how, how much of a failure that I was like, I'm just treading water, you know, as I got started and it was really frustrating making that pivot. I don't, I don't know if, I don't know how many people have made a pivot midlife where you just switch completely from one career to another. And it was still something I know but in a, in a way I've never done it before. And so um, the levels of stress, the levels of anxiety were, I'm going to say a number 10 on a scale of mm -hmm. one to 10. Um, I would, I would lie awake at night if I fell asleep and it was, it was great if I did, but if I fell asleep, I'd wake up an hour later and I, yeah, I'd be wide awake and, you know, thoughts would just be racing through my brain. And then I couldn't get back to sleep at night. It was, it was just awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like it was a lot for you to do all at once, like a lot of changes all at once. And I, I think that can many times be a, a trigger for people when there's a period of change and transition. And especially like you were saying, you didn't feel as though you had those skills, then that can make you feel even more doubtful and more insecure because then there's those worries that come up, like, am I doing this the right way? Or, um, you know, is this going to meet up to, since you are a high achiever, to those high expectations that you had for yourself. Um, and so I could imagine there was a lot of that 
inner turmoil going on for you that I think a lot of my listeners can identify with. I know that, that um, I go back, I go back to a, a, <laughs> a grounding place for myself. And I have to say to myself, if I don't sleep at night, no one benefits from that except me. Everyone else is affected by it, but no one benefits from it except me. So I have to get to my, myself to a place of where I can sleep and get a good night's sleep at night. That is really paramount to everything that I do. The second thing that's really paramount to my, my success that I found for me personally over the years is I have to eat healthy foods and not to say like, oh, I'm such a nutritionalist or anything. Cause I'm not, and I'm a very simple person and my diet is super boring. I just eat like, you know, whole foods pretty much that are, they could be room temperature. They could be cooked. They could be raw. It doesn't matter. And I don't make fancy recipes or any of that stuff. I, I eat to survive, not you know, to, to really enjoy luxurious mm -hmm. meals and all that stuff. No one benefits though, from the food that I eat, except myself. And so if I stay away from preservatives and I stay away from fake foods, I say fake foods, like if you can pick it up out of a box and eat it, it's probably a fake food, you know, mm -hmm. like something that grows is going to be more healthy for me. But if I, if I eat nutritious foods, I'm the only one that benefits from that. That's something I can't outsource. I cannot outsource my nutrition to someone else. I have to do that for myself. And that is paramount to the way my brain thinks, the way that I feel about myself, the, the levels of stress that are reduced are based on the types of foods that I eat. If I eat crappy foods, I feel crappy. It's just how I work. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I cannot outsource is my exercise. And I've tried, you know, you, you buy a gym membership and you hope that just by buying the membership, you're going to be toned and fit and yay, you know, but it doesn't work that way. You have to actually show up and you have to work out. And if I don't have time to work out, I can put on a pair of running shoes and I can go out my front door and I can jog. And so there are things that I can do where I am, even if I have short amounts of time, there are times that even working from home, I would just leave and I would run around the block you know, 10 minutes, that's it. That's all I got right now, but I will take it. 10 minutes is better than not, not 10 minutes. Right. And if I can do that two or three times a day, maybe I can, you know, piece together a small workout, but no one benefits from that except myself. So those are three things, the sleep, the nutrition, and the exercise that I, I discovered. I cannot outsource no matter how, how much money I have or how successful my business is. Mm. Yeah. I, I love that perspective that how you put it, that you can't outsource that to anybody else and it only benefits you. And those things can definitely have a big impact on mood and mental health and anxiety levels. And I think another thing is our environment. And I'd love to hear more about your perspective when it comes to, you know, your environment and, and keeping things clean and keeping things organized. Cause I think a lot of times when people get busy, that can be one of the first things to go is that, you know, it's, it's harder to keep things organized and it's harder to keep things clean because you're so focused on other things. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that. You know, that's a really interesting question because what happened during the pandemic is we had lots of people that because they were staying at home, like everyone stay at home. Okay. So everybody stayed at home. What happened while they were staying at home though, is they started looking around and they're like, I got two guest bedrooms in here that we have plugged with stuff. It's just weird stuff that we don't know what's in there. We, don't, we, we haven't gone through it in a while. We're not, we're kind of here. Maybe we should now start decluttering and going through that stuff and whatever. They started pulling stuff out when they realized we've got a lot of stuff we never use. We have stuff that's here because we inherited it from someone else. And we discovered during the pandemic, and this was really weird, we discovered as people started going through their stuff that they have about five spaces that are cluttered and busy. We call them scary rooms. It's a scary room or a scary closet where you just kind of chunked everything in there and closed the door and made it look nice for when the relatives come over. And so now they're like pulling all that stuff out and they have like a scary room or they have a shed in the back of their yard or they have a garage that's full of stuff or they have a storage unit that they've been kind of like hiding stuff in. And a lot of it, we found there are six generations of stuff on the average that people have accessibility to. So like their parents have passed away and left them with the house. The spouse's parents passed away and left them with the house. They have their own house. So now they've got three houses between them. They have a storage unit that one of the parents had. Then they have their own storage unit that they put all their kids stuff in when the kid went to college. Now they've got like five spaces of things that have been passed down from generation to generation. 
And they're sitting here with a bunch of stuff that they're like, what on earth do we do with all this stuff? You, you ask the question, how does that affect your mental health? And, and how do you deal with all that clutter? Well, it's pulling out all this stuff and get ri- getting rid of it and downsizing and minimalizing some of that stuff that will create space in your life for just, just the liberation of, hey, we don't have so much stuff that we have to you know, sort through and go through because it is overwhelming just to know that you have all this stuff that you have to deal with it. But it's even more overwhelming if you're tripping over it and it's inside your house, especially as you get older in, in life. Because as mobility devices are introduced into your lifestyle and you're trying to get now around the house with a walker, if there's stuff in the way and your walker doesn't get through or your wheelchair doesn't get through, all of a sudden you've created trip hazards for yourself. And at that phase of life, that's when you don't have time and you don't have the energy to sit there and go through five sections of your life, either homes or storage units or attics or garages or sheds or whatever that you have of stuff. And so if you can get rid of that before, then now's the time to do that. And then there are also things like the situation that I was in when we had a troubled teenager come to live with us. That is not a time when you want to like be decluttering and you know what I mean? That that's Mm -hmm. not where your focus is. And so what we found was there are a lot of people that get really wrapped up in what's going on in their personal lives. And we saw this, especially during the pandemic where we had first responders and essential workers. They're out working and they're working overtime because like when COVID brought a whole bunch of people to the hospitals, we had nurses and doctors that were working overtime, 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 overtime. The doctors and nurses' families though are at home. So they're buying stuff online. They're sorting through stuff. The doctors and nurses came home. They just crashed, jumped up, grabbed food and went off to work again. So they're not, they're not, cleaning up their house during this period of time, they're just working and their house is getting twice the use that it got before. So now they're like, our house has turned into a hoarding house and that was never our intention. Now now they're at a high functioning anxiety level for this very exact same reason. Their houses have become overwhelmed with stuff. And so they're like, can you help us get rid of some of the stuff that we have? And so we started on the Ask a House Cleaner show, we started what's called the Clutter Corner. And it was an interesting tactic where we started bringing not all your stuff, don't unload everything because then you just have this massive pile that's so overwhelming that's that is just going to create and you know, produce more stress. If you just bring one item to a table, then we can have a conversation about the item and we can make rules about that item. Because if we don't know how we feel about that item and we don't make a rule for um, managing that item in our lives, then if we get rid of that item, that's great for today, but here's what happens. Next week, next month, somebody goes to a yard sale, they go to a thrift store, they see a clearance rack, there's a great big bin of something on sale and they replace the item they just got rid of with something new. They created a void and then they fill the void. So without the rules in place for how you feel about that and how you're gonna manage that, and it's things like VHS tapes. Do you have a VHS player? And lots of people say, I I don't think I even have one anymore. Is it safe to assume then that you won't be watching VHS tapes anymore? And if that's the case, can we make a new rule that we don't buy any new VHS tapes from here on out? And they go, yeah, that's a good rule. Okay, great. So now we've addressed how we feel about that. Now, if you're going through a Walmart and you see a great big bin of VHS tapes that are on sale and they're $2 a piece, while they might be great titles and it might be a movie you enjoyed, We're not going to buy those tapes because we know now that we can stream that movie online from Netflix or Hulu or whatever, when we want to see it again, and we don't have to buy that tape. So now we've made a new rule about that tape. We got rid of the, the VHS tapes in the house, but now we made a new rule. We won't be replacing it with a physical tangible item. Does Mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like it's really being intentional with how you're getting rid of things and then whether or not you're replacing them and, and what that looks like rather than, like you said, it it creates a void if you get rid of things. And so then you might just, without even thinking about it, bring something new into your house and then just add to the opposite of what you're trying to do. Well, th- there is a, a common concern because as families, if members of the family had something We assume that it meant something to them when in essence, sometimes it doesn't. And so if you can declutter while you're young and while you have the ability to communicate, that's the time to do that. 
For example, when I got married, the uh, a relative of ours gave us this really fancy little bronze statue. It was beautiful and it was glazed and it had this, you know, really glossy colors of a little frog sitting on a mushroom reading a book. <laughs> Don't ask me what it was for, or what it meant. I was like, oh, that's cool and weird and eclectic and whatever. Okay, cool. <laughs> and I didn't really have any place for it. It didn't match any of the decor in the home. It was kind of weird and cute and whatever, but they were coming over for dinner. So I took it and I put it right there on the floor of the fireplace, right there on the, the ledge. And I thought, well, I'll just kind of display it as a way of saying thank you for this, this, you know, frog that you gave me. Well, when they came back, they were like, oh, she really liked it. Look, she put it front and center in her living room. And so I was rewarding the wrong behavior by saying, oh, look, I love this so much that for the next holiday, they gave me another frog. Mm. And the other family members started seeing this little display of frogs. And they're like, oh, Angela really likes frogs. Well, within a five or six year window for every birthday, every Christmas, Mother's Day, whatever, I started getting like plates that had frogs on them and calendars with frogs and books with frogs and these little stepping stones that go out in your yard with frogs on them. I was like, what, what the heck? What, what's with these frogs? What, what is going on here? <laughs> the catch is this. The frogs never meant anything to me. I had no connection with the frogs whatsoever. I didn't want them. I didn't need them. I don't collect frogs. It had nothing to do with anything in my life. There was like no attachment whatsoever. But here's the catch. Within about a six or seven year window after I got married, there were probably at least a hundred frogs in my house that people had given me as gifts. If I'd been hit by a bus and my family came all the way across the country and they went through my estate, if they looked at all the stuff I had, they'd say, oh, we didn't know Angela was really attached to frogs and they would have split them up and they would have paid for shipping to go to my brothers and sisters across the country. And everyone in my family would have tried to like, hang on for dear life to these frogs because this was a part of me. And they, you see where I'm headed with yeah. this? Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with me. And many people are hanging on to stuff of their parents and their grandparents and whatever that they think meant something to their family. And they want to do right by their family by hanging on to these items that in truth may have had nothing to do with the person at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if when you're young, you can say, hey, you know, what? I, the frogs really didn't mean anything to me. I don't want to be known by the frogs. Please don't give me any more frogs. We're done with the frogs now. When I sold the house, I sold the house frogs and everything. <laughs> I told the homeowner, I said, hey, this house comes with frogs. There are frogs <laughs> everywhere and they bring good luck. So I'm going to let you have all the frogs with the house. I said, I don't care if you sell them on eBay or Etsy or whatever, but these are now yours. And I walked away from all the frogs. I'm like, let's get, let's get rid of that. I don't need all these frogs. And I don't, I don't like dusting them. And you know what I mean? It's, it, it's a lot to keep up with, mm -hmm. but how many people have stuff like that in their homes that they think they're doing right by somebody by hanging on to it when in essence, that's not the case at all. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no. And I think that's a great story to, to illustrate that. And, and I'd love to hear before we finish up, just are there any tips or advice that you have maybe for somebody who is really busy and maybe they don't have the time to clean as much as they would like um, and uh, maybe they're not at the point of, of hiring somebody to clean their house, what, what would you suggest for that, uh, that person? I love the question and I get asked that question I'm going to say a hundred times a week, mm -hmm. because here's the reality. Nobody really live. I don't want to say nobody. There are a few people that love to clean, but the majority of people don't love to clean. It's just kind of like something you have to do every day. And there are people that are like, oh, I'm not going to clean. I hate cleaning. So cleaning is part of every day. It's like brushing your teeth or getting dressed or something. It's just like part of your day. And so don't give it any more importance than there is to it because it's just part of your day. It's just something that you do. And so there are decluttering routines and there are cleaning routines and they're two very different things. But my suggestion is if you don't have time to do it and you're super busy and you are one of these essential workers or you're a high achiever and you have another business with other priorities, or if you're raising a troubled teenager and you have just cleaning is not your thing, decluttering is not your thing, you don't have time for it, whittle it in little tiny snippets where you can. Just if there's a little gap, just plug it in where you can. And by that, I mean, when you get up from the dinner table, instead of just getting up and walking away, you have, you have 30 seconds, you can take the, the dishes back to the kitchen sink. If you have another 30 seconds, you can put them inside the dishwasher. 
When you get up first thing in the morning, the very first thing, just make your bed. It, it only takes a couple of seconds to make your bed. I say a couple, maybe 30 seconds. You're going to go in and take a shower anyway. While you're in the shower, grab the squeegee and squeegee down the walls. When you brush your teeth, you're, you're right there at the, at the sink, right? Just have a cloth nearby so that you can wipe off your electric toothbrush and the toothbrush holder. Wipe the vanity around you know, where your makeup is and your hair stuff. Put the makeup back in a little bag and put it in the drawer or put it underneath the bathroom sink where it goes. It doesn't need to be strewn all about. That, that doesn't serve anyone. It just collects dust. But you're going to be standing there anyway. It only takes a couple of extra seconds and you get in the habit of doing these little itty bitty tiny micro routines that then build on top of each other. So that when you walk through the bedroom, oh, look, the bed is made. You go through the bathroom and there's the shower, but the, the glass has been all squeegeed off. So it looks nice and clean and you don't have a soap scum buildup. You go into the, the toilet. Everybody's going to use the toilet every day. There's no reason if you have a toilet brush right next to the toilet that you can't swish it around the inside of the bowl for 10 seconds. 10 seconds a day will keep rings from building up inside your toilet. It doesn't take a lot of work. It's 10 seconds. And you're going to be in there anyway, right? You're in that little room anyway. It's uninterrupted time. Grab the toilet brush, 10 seconds. It's a micro routine. But these little tiny micro routines prevent, oh, the toilet is so nasty. And now I've got to go in there and spend a half hour scouring it out, using pumice stones and all this stuff. You don't, you don't need to do that. And if we stay on top of it, even the busiest of people can grab a cloth and just wipe off the vanity and wipe off the toothbrush. It takes what, like seven seconds, right? It's mm -hmm. not a huge process. So there are little tiny things that we can do along the way. And as far as the decluttering goes, because lots of people think you got to yank everything out of the closet and sort it in piles and there's a donation bin and it. No, 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 no. You don't need to do that. Just go pick one item. Just pick one item, go in the closet and say, today, I'm going to get rid of the bathrobes. I'm going to pick out all the excess bathrobes. I'm going to scoop them up. I'm going to put them in the back of the car. When I go run my errands, I'm going to drop them off at the Goodwill. That's it. Just the bathrobes. Don't overwhelm yourself and don't create these huge piles because that does get overwhelming and it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Then somebody's going to come over and you're going to say, oh, let me just chunk everything back in the closet and I'll deal with it later. Now you're tripping over stuff and you're digging through the pile, looking for clean clothes. Just, just don't create extra messes because you won't have time, especially if you're super busy. Mm -hmm. Micro routines. Yeah, I, I love those tips and it's it's so simple and so accessible and I can definitely see how those small things then add up in the long run so that you don't have to like spend hours cleaning the bathroom or whatever else might build up um, because you're neglecting to do those day-to-day -day things. Perfect, thank you so much. And I know that you have resources on helping, uh, you have house cleaners to uh, build their businesses as well as uh, cleaning as well. So where can people find you and connect with you further? Oh, thanks so much for asking. So it's askahousecleaner.com where you can learn all about house cleaning and decluttering. And I have a decluttering playlist that I think would be really interesting where we walk you through the clutter corner item by item and help you get rid of that extra stuff inside your house. Perfect. Yeah. So I will leave a link to those resources in the show notes. And it was really great to speak with you today, Angela. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was really excellent. I appreciate that.